our speaker tonight, Mark Margaris, uh, uh, did his undergraduate work at Bethany College in Kansas. Uh, I also went to a small school in the Midwest called Kalamazoo College. And so we, we have that in common. We went to small liberal arts schools. Uh, in addition, Mark was quarterback for the Fighting Swedes at Bethany College. <laughs> and so who knew that Bethany College was the Fighting Swedes? <laughs> They're in Lindborg, Kansas, and that's why. Uh, I was quarterback for my intramural team. <laughs> so we, we, again, have, have so many things in common. Mark was graduated summa cum laude. Uh, I graduated with a solid B average. <laughs> so we both graduated, so we have that in common. Uh, uh, Mark then uh, went to do graduate work at uh, Florida State University, where he worked on uh, the venoms of rattlesnakes and, and how those uh, relate to the evolution of, of venoms and the effects on hosts. Uh, from uh, Florida State, he then went to Washington State University, right, Washington State, uh, where he uh, first started working on Tasmanian devils. Uh, and this is really a, a fascinating story, uh, as uh, you likely are aware if, if the interest brought you here tonight. Uh, they have these facial cancers that are infectious. And my own expertise is infectious diseases. My labs are over on the Mass General campus of, of the Harvard Med School. Uh, and so we're quite interested in how diseases get transmitted from one person to the next. Uh, and to have a cancer that's transmitted that way is really, really fascinating. So it's, uh, even though cancer isn't my uh, specialty, uh, it, it tr how things get passed from one, one animal or person to the next is. So uh, Mark is taking a, a molecular biological approach to these studies uh, that involve aspects of genomics and comparing the biochemistry of uh, systems uh, to try to find patterns and commonalities uh, and to understand the underlying mechanisms. Uh, with that, uh, let me ask you to help me welcome to the stage, essentially my twin brother, Mark Margaris. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you tonight uh, about some of my research looking at infectious cancers and Tasmanian devils. Uh, so you can see the outline of my talk at the top of every slide to help you follow along and orient yourself as we go. So like many biologists, I'm interested in understanding patterns of diversity, uh, which are widespread across the tree of life, from color variation in tree frogs found in the Peruvian Amazon, to variation in body form and shape in teleost fish, or flower color in morning glory. And now part of my research program focuses on identifying the mechanisms and processes that produce these patterns of biodiversity, but the other aspect of my research program focuses on threats to biodiversity. One of the largest threats to biodiversity and human health today are pathogens called emerging infectious diseases, or EIDs. Uh, so emerging infectious diseases, they are infectious pathogens that are rapidly increasing in incidence, geographic range, or both. They're sort of summarized in this figure here from 2017. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the diseases you are seeing here, things like HIV, the Zika virus, lots of the infectious diseases that get a lot of attention in mainstream media. Deliberately emerging? I'm sorry? Deliberately emerging on the bottom? Yes, so uh, newly emerging is in red. These are rather new diseases. Re-emerging in blue um, is uh, diseases that you know sort of were once believed to be uh, reducing in disease, and now we're increasing in incidence again. And to be perfectly honest, deliberately emerging is only anthrax bioterrorism. So that's a very different type of emerging infectious agent. Yes, good question. Uh, so some common examples of EIDs in humans are uh, the Ebola virus. So here we are looking at rapid increase in the number of cases in Sierra Leone in 2014. Um, another common example in humans is the coronavirus in China, which is getting a lot of recent attention. Here we are looking at the number of cases uh, at the end of January. I think as of yesterday, there are now a, right, right around 75,000 cases um, in Asia or China alone. 
Um, but emerging infectious diseases, they affect not just people, they also affect animal systems. Uh, so an emerging infectious disease uh, example in an animal system is chytrid in uh, amphibians. So chytrid, this is a fungal disease that has decimated hundreds of amphibian species worldwide. And here we are looking at the number of frog species affected in Central America. And we can see that about 100 species in total have exceeded greater than 90% declines as a result of this fungal infection. Another example in a non-human system is that of white-nose syndrome in bats. So again, this is another fungal infection. Um, you can see it manifesting itself as these white areas around the face of the bat. And this fungal disease is also threatening many American species of bat with extinction. It has actually killed millions of bats um, in North America over the last 10 years. And emerging infectious diseases have actually been identified as the sixth leading cause of species decline over the last 20 years. And most of the work on emerging infectious diseases has focused on, is focused on managing outbreaks, right? And if we look at what is happening in China with the current coronavirus outbreak, we see things like quarantines or travel restrictions in an attempt to limit the spread of the disease. We see the use of genomics to, test for rap or to develop tests for rapid identification so we can monitor how the disease is spreading and if it's spreading into new areas. We see a lot of effort being spent on treating the infected and developing more effective treatments or potentially vaccines to, again, limit spread and reduce disease virulence. But following the initial outbreak, once the pathogen has actually established itself in the population, we really need to understand host pathogen coevolution. Because really, once the pathogen has engrossed itself in the population, the next important question is what's going to happen next? And that is going to be dictated, at least in part, by the coevolutionary interactions between hosts and these diseases. Now, despite more than 1.5 million people being diagnosed with cancer every year just here in the United States alone, we would typically not classify cancer as, as an emerging infectious disease because cancer is typically not infectious. Uh, so cancer, in the broadest sense, is a disease of abnormal cell growth. Um, and while it often has the ability to spread to other parts of the body, it typically does not have the ability to spread to other individuals in the population. And this is because cancer is often somatic in origin. And what I mean by that is that it originates within an individual from changes within an individual's own cells and therefore stays within that individual. Cancer is usually then this self-limiting disease. Cancer will either regress and the host will live or it will progress and kill the host, but the death of the host is also the death of the cancer cell line itself. Now this is usually where someone will ask me about HPV, their human papillomavirus, and whether that represents an infectious cancer in humans. Um, very briefly, the answer is no. Uh, so HPV, this is a viral infection. And while a viral infection can lead to the development of cervical cancer and even some other cancers, um, it's actually the virus that is transmitted from one individual to another. So HPV is actually the most common sexually transmitted infection in humans. But again, it's the virus that is, in, uh, that is transmitted, not the cancer itself. And while viral infection can lead to the development of cancer, it does not always lead to the, to the development of cancer. Now, with that said, we do have a few special cases where cancer has been transmitted from one person to another. Um, sort of a unique example um, was seen in the case of organ transplants. So in the mid-2000s, a 53-year-old woman in Europe unfortunately passed away from a stroke. Um, and she was an organ donor. And she donated her kidneys, her lungs, her liver, her heart, and then about 16 months later to two years later, strange things started to happen to the recipients. Um, their health started to fail, wasn't clear why. Um, they went to see their medical professionals and it was found that there was breast cancer cells from the donor in the tissues that they had received. So breast cancer cells had spread to the liver, they had spread to the kidneys, they had spread to the lungs, and unfortunately these organ recipients had actually received cancer from the donor. Um, and many of these recipients, unfortunately, passed away from the cancer several years after receiving these organs. Um, now, this is a special case. This is not natural, right? It's an organ transplant. And it also involves immunosuppression. So typically, when you receive an organ, your immune system has to be suppressed, so you do not reject that organ. Um, but unfortunately, by suppressing the immune system in this case, it also led the recipients to not reject the cancer cells either. Um, now, this is really rare. I don't want people to think that this is common at all in organ transplants. Organ donors do undergo a battery of tests to try to prevent this sort of thing from happening. But obviously, we cannot test for everything. Um, this woman passed away from a stroke. She had undetected breast cancer. We also have some rare cases where there actually has been placental transmission between mother and the fetus in the womb. 
or we often have, uh, we also have twin-to-twin um, -twin transfer in the room as well of blood cancers, things like leukemia. Uh, but again, all of these instances are exceptionally rare. Uh, I think blood-to-blood -blood transmission is estimated to be like 0.0005% or something like that. Right? So we do have instances of cancer being transmitted from one person to another, but it is exceptionally rare. But three naturally occurring transmissible or infectious cancers have been documented. Um, and when I say three, they've been documented in three different systems. Uh, so the first is canine transmissible venereal tumor in dogs, uh, two different versions of devil facial tumor disease in Tasmanian devils, and then several infectious cancers found in bivalves, what's called bivalve transmissible neoplasia. So these diseases, they're infectious clonal cell lines, and they function sort of as allografts or skin grafts, where cancer cells are transmitted from an infected individual to a healthy individual. Those cells will then stick to their new host, evade immune detection, and grow uncontrollably. And at least we can see in uh, the two examples in vertebrates that we have that evasion of MHC is really key to transmission. Um, so I'll touch on this in a little more detail later, but MHC, or the major histocompatibility complex, this is a part of our immune system that aids in the recognition of foreign molecules or foreign antigens, things that are in our body that should not be there, like diseases and pathogens. And what these cancers have done is evaded MHC detection in these immune systems. Now, canine transmissible venereal tumor, this is a sexually transmitted infectious disease in dogs. Um, it's a pretty old disease. It's been around for several thousand years. Uh, but surgery is nearly 100% effective, and it's very rarely fatal. You take your dog to the vet, your dog's going to be OK. Bivalve transmissible neoplasia, this is the most recently discovered disease. Much less is known about it. Um, it exists in several different species of bivalve. It's actually been shown to jump species boundaries through the water column. So one species of clam can actually pass this cancer to another species of clam. And it's predominantly fatal in some instances, but not always. Uh, so unlike in dogs and to a lesser extent in bivalves, devil facial tumor disease in Tasmanian devils is uniformly fatal. Uh, so this disease threatens the Tasmanian devil with extinction, and this is going to be the system I'm going to focus on for this seminar. So just a little bit of background. Yes, the Tasmanian devil is real. It is not just a cartoon character. Uh, so it's the world's largest living marsupial carnivore, and it is shown here on the right. Uh, they once lived uh, widespread across the continent of Australia, but they are now restricted to the, or, uh, they are now restricted to the island state of Tasmania, shown off the southern coast here. Uh, so devils, they typically live about five to six years. They're the size of a small dog, um, and they're scavengers. So they largely feed on dead wallabies and other carcasses that they find across the landscape. So there should be a slide here. Um, so in 1996, researchers began noticing these strange facial tumors popping up on the northeastern part of the island. So if we imagine Tasmania is here, in the very northeastern corner, uh, Researchers found these devils, again, with these strange facial tumors. And at first, this wasn't a concern. So devils will often get injuries around their mouth when they're biting one another and fighting over a carcass. And they're also prone to benign neoplasias or benign tumors. Um, there we go. But very quickly, researchers noticed that the disease was spreading. Animals were dying in very large numbers. And the symptomology of this was very different from anything that we had seen before. Uh, so this is devil facial tumor disease, or DFTD. So again, this is an infectious clonal cell line. And we can see, since its initial discovery in 1996, it has spread almost completely across the island. These lines that you were looking at here are the approximate disease fronts from 2000 to 2018. And on its march westward, it has reduced the total population by more than 80%. Um, and pretty much all devils appear to be susceptible. Uh, the tumor nearly always results in death within six months of symptoms. Unfortunately, the tumor grows to such an extent that it prevents feeding, and usually the animals eventually starve to death. Um, so we couple this universal susceptibility with uniform mortality. This led everyone to believe that this was going to be the extinction of the Tasmanian devil. So where did this disease come from? Um, you know, that was sort of a big question when this disease was first discovered, before I began working in this system. Um, that was one of the major questions. Where did this disease originate? We know that it came from the northeastern part of the island. But where did it come from? Uh, so that's what we are looking at here. Here we're looking at a cluster analysis of gene expression data. So researchers sequenced a bunch of tissues in the Tasmanian devil and then the tumor tissue. And they wanted to see what tissue the gene expression of that tumor was most similar to. Because that would give us an idea of potentially what tissue the tumor originated in. So here on the left, tissues are clustered by similarity. 
And we can see that DFTD on the right clusters most similarly with something labeled PN. This is peripheral nerve tissue. Okay, so peripheral nerve cells, uh, they're involved with uh, uh, nerve regeneration. And they also play a role um, in cancer spread or can play a role in cancer spread. And a little bit more digging found that uh, DFTD most likely originated in a Schwann cell. So this Schwann cell, this is a type of peripheral nerve cell. And some additional sequencing of the DFTD tumor showed that it had pieces of the X chromosome and not the Y chromosome. So devils like us, they have X and Y sex chromosomes. And what this suggested was that this disease originated in a female devil from a Schwann cell origin in the northeastern part of the island sometime pre-1996. So how did it spread, right? Initially when it originated, well, cancer can originate, but it typically does not spread, right? So the evolution of transmissibility is a big question here in this system. Um, and at first, researchers thought, well, maybe it's just a lack of genetic diversity in the Tasmanian devil. So here on the left, we are looking at mitochondrial genetic diversity across a suite of mammals. So we have diversity increasing on the y-axis. The higher the bar, the more genetic diversity you have. And what we can see is that the Tasmanian devil, which is all the way down here, has very little genetic diversity. It actually has less genetic diversity than every mammal that was sequenced, except for the now extinct Tasmanian tiger, or the thylacine. So researchers thought, OK, it's just a lack of genetic diversity. And while I am showing uh, mitochondrial genetic diversity here, this holds for MHC diversity. Now remember, MHC diversity, this is what allows our immune system to recognize foreign antigens. And essentially, the more diverse your MHC is, the more foreign molecules you can recognize as being foreign. And Tasmanian devils have very little MHC diversity, so we thought, okay, they just can't recognize the cancer as foreign. So to test this, researchers did some challenge experiments. They took skin grafts from one devil and transplanted them to another devil to see if they could recognize it. And in all cases, devils rejected the skin grafts. Right? So even though devils have very little genetic diversity, they're at least able to recognize the skin of another devil as foreign and reject it. So why are they not able to recognize and reject the cancer? This suggests that a lack of genetic diversity in devils may be playing a role, but it doesn't explain everything that we're seeing. It suggests that there may be something specific to the cancer itself. And when we look at what the cancer does, um, they can essentially shut off MHC class 1, and this allows them to evade immune detection. So what we are looking at here in this gel image on the right, we have this MHC class 1 row here. So a band indicates presence, a lack of band indicates absence. And we can see that MHC class 1, while it's present in normal spleen tissue in a devil, it's absent in our DFTD tumor sample. So MHC class 1, these are surface molecules, right? So these are on the surfaces of cells, and it indicates what that cell is. So what, and typically in our body, cells, they have these receptors on the surface. It lets all the other cells and the immune system know what those cells are. So what the tumor has done is just shut those off. Right, so the devil immune system has no idea to know what that particular cell is, doesn't recognize it as foreign, does not attack it, and essentially the cancer hides in plain sight. And it can just grow uncontrollably. So how is it spread? We know that it originated in the Northeast. We know that it shuts off MHC, and that's how it's able to grow and not be detected by the immune system. But what's the route of transmission? How is it actually transmitted from one individual to another? Well, the disease is spread via biting which is very common during social interactions, and pictured here on the right. Now what we are looking at here on the left is we have the probability of developing an infection on the y-axis, then we have the number of bites on the x-axis. And what's interesting is that we can see devils that are bitten a lot, more than 15 times, have very little chance of actually contracting the disease, whereas devils that are bitten only a few times have a very high probability of contracting the disease. Well, if the disease is spread via biting, how does this make any sense, right? This suggests that being bitten should potentially give you a greater chance of contracting the disease, but that's not what we're seeing at all. And what this suggests is that it's not being bitten that increases your chance of contracting the disease. It's actually doing the biting. So the way that we think transmission works is that a healthy devil will bite the tumor of an infected devil. Those cells will then stick to the new host, shut off MHC, evade immune detection, and grow uncontrollably. And uh, animals that are bitten less are typically your large dominant males. These are the animals that are biting a lot. Again, suggesting that it is the biter, not the bitee, who is actually contracting the disease. 
So as I mentioned earlier, as the disease has marched westward, reduces the total population by more than 80%. In all of our epidemiological models, all of our disease models actually predicted devil extinction within 25 to 30 years. And when we look at sort of census size data, we can see why. Uh, so here we are looking at the number of devils in a particular population. We can see that before the disease gets there in 1999 and 2000, we have over 100 devils in the population. The disease arrives in 2001, which is indicated by the red bar here. We can see the population crashes to just a handful of individuals. But despite these population crashes, despite our model's predicted extinction, no local extinction events have actually occurred. Every population that has become infected is still hanging in there. And some populations, including the population shown here, are actually beginning to recover. Right, so what's going on here? Why are our models wrong? Why are we not seeing extinction? Um, we're actually seeing the exact opposite pattern, right? We're actually seeing population recovery. Well, these sort of simple epidemiological models or these disease models, they don't account for the evolutionary process. And this pattern of population recovery suggests that the devils are responding to the strong selection imposed by DFTD. And this is sort of my interest, really, what is happening here? What are the mechanisms that are allowing the devils to respond to the selection imposed by DFTD, adapt to that disease, and begin to increase in number? So one thing that we've shown is that there are sex-based differences um, in how devils deal with the disease. So we have found that female devils are actually much more tolerant of the infection than males. So here in the figure, we have body condition on our y-axis. So essentially here, the higher the number, the healthier the devil, the lower the number, the poorer health of the devil. And we have tumor volume relative to the size of the devil on the x-axis. We have females on the left, males on the right. And we can see that when males become infected with the disease, as the tumor grows, they suffer pretty significant costs in body condition, up to 25% costs in body condition. Whereas female devils suffer much less costs, only up to about a 5% reduction in body condition. And I want to point out here the differences in the x-axis. So these are relative estimates of the tumor volume to the devil's size. And we can see that our x-axis ends at 0.03 here. Right? Males essentially don't live past tumors of that size, whereas female devils are able to survive tumors of much larger size. Right? So we are excited about this. We have this pattern of population recovery. And it appears that females may be driving part of that. Female devils are more tolerant of the disease. Um, but I'm a geneticist. Right, so I was interested in what's actually going on here. What are the genes involved with this? What's the molecular mechanism underlying this pattern? So to get at this, we did something called a genome-wide association study, or a GWAS. And we were trying to link genetic variation at particular genes with the variation in survival that we were seeing across sexes. So what you're looking at here on the left, on the y-axis, we have the proportion of phenotypic variation explained. For, for survival following infection. Essentially, that axis shows you how much variation in female survival can we explain by looking at variation in the genome. And what we found is that we can explain a lot of the variation in female survival following infection, actually 80%, which is quite a lot for these types of analyses, but we're unable to really explain a lot of the variation in males. And when we look at the specific genes that are associated with increased female survival, we see genes with functions that make good intuitive sense. Things related to chronic inflammation, which we can imagine would be a problem with these large facial tumors. Uh, immune function, non-self recognition, which is really important for the transmissibility of this disease. Um, and all of these changes, we saw these rapid changes in about four to six generations. So this is all happening very, very quickly. Um, and we sequenced most of the genome, and about 10,000 mutations explained 80% of this variation. But five mutations actually explain 60% of that variation. So you have very few changes explaining a lot of the variation, suggesting that those are the result of adaptive evolution. Another pattern that we're interested in uh, associated with population recovery is that of natural unmedicated tumor regression. Uh, so in the northwestern part of the island, a handful of devils were caught, including the individual shown here, and confirmed to be infected with the disease. But these individuals were then trapped several months later, and the tumors had either substantially shrunk or had entirely disappeared. Right, so in this particular case, this female devil was caught. We can see this large ulcerated tumor on her chin. Biopsy was taken, confirmed to be DFTD. She was then trapped three months later, and we can see that despite some scarring, the tumor is pretty much gone. The devil appeared healthy. And we're obviously, again, interested in understanding how this happens from both a conservation standpoint to help the Tasmanian devil, but also from a biomedical perspective. 
right? How does this natural, unmedicated tumor regression occur? These devils were not treated. They were not given any medication. This just happened naturally. And really what we wanted to know was, is this something intrinsic to the devil? Is there a particular mutation or set of mutations in the Tasmanian devil that led to tumor regression? Or is it something in the tumor? Is there a particular mutation or set of mutations in the tumor that led to regression? Or is it a combination of the two? Is it genotype by genotype interactions? And what I mean by that is that do we only get tumor regression if we get the right tumor infecting the right devil? That there's genetic variation important to each, and you only get this phenotype when those two are matched. So we're still working out this last part. Uh, so for this talk, I'm going to focus on just the host mechanisms and the tumor mechanisms. So first, we looked at the Tasmanian devils. And essentially what we did is we compared the genomes of devils that underwent tumor regression and devils that didn't. And we looked for large differences, right? Because differences between those groups could potentially help explain why some underwent tumor regression and some did not. And that's what we are looking at here in this figure on top, in this Manhattan plot. So here we have genomic position on the x-axis. So Tasmanian devils, they have six chromosomes plus the sex chromosome. And on the y-axis, we have genetic differentiation increasing on the y-axis. And then each point you see corresponds to a different SNP or a different mutation, right? So here, the higher that point is in the plot, the more different it is between devils that underwent regression and devils that did not, and therefore it could potentially explain that difference. And what we found is that there were several genomic regions, several regions of the, deno of the genome were very different between devils that underwent regression and devils that did not. And those are highlighted in blue here, with really our strongest signal in three regions, one on chromosome three, and then two different regions on chromosome five. And when we look at what genes are in those regions, we identify several genes that are uh, putative tumor suppressors. So what tumor suppressors do, they help regulate cell division. Um, and they can affect cell proliferation or cell growth and cell survival. And typically what we see is that in cancers, tumor suppressors break. And that's one of the ways that cancer actually forms. Cell division is no longer controlled. These cells can grow uncontrollably and lead to the formation of tumors. And this really important variation that we're seeing here, these particular genes suggest that maybe devils are trying to restore those functions, and that potentially is contributing to tumor regression. So we're exploring these candidate genes a little bit more. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on them today. So then we looked at the tumor genomes, right? So the same thing. We took regressed tumors, and we took tumors that did not undergo regression, non-regressed tumors, and we compared their genomes, and we looked for large differences. Um, and one of the more intriguing differences that we found was a single mutation in a gene called RASL11A. Um, so RASL11A, again, this is a putative tumor suppressor, um, and it plays a role in our DNA transcription, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. But essentially, this gene helps regulate cell division. And what we see in human prostate cancers is that this gene is inactivated. So what we are looking at here on the right, we are essentially looking at the expression level or the activity of this gene in normal prostate tissue in gray, and then prostate cancer in black. And we can see that the activity of this gene is much reduced in prostate cancer relative to normal prostate tissue, right? Suggesting that somehow the activity of this gene is usually shut off in cancer. And when we look at DFTD, what we see in our non-regressed tumors is that they have this T allele at this particular locus, whereas our regressed tumors they have all had a mutation event where they now have one T and one C, right? So our non-regressed tumors are all homozygous at this site. Our regressed tumors are all heterozygous. There's a fixed genotypic difference at this site. And this occurs in a regulatory element. This occurs in the part of the genome that controls the activity of this gene. So we're like, OK, maybe this particular mutation could somehow affect the activity of this gene differentially in regressed and non-regressed tumors. And that could potentially contribute to tumor regression. So to test that, we sequenced the transcriptomes of regressed and non-regressed tumors. Essentially, we did some sequencing to measure the activity of this gene in each tumor type. And sort of our expectation would be that, OK, in our non-regressed tumors, we would expect to see something like we see in prostate cancer. We would expect to see a very low activity of this gene in our non-regressed tumors. But maybe in our regressed tumors, we see something like more normal activity levels like we see in healthy tissue. Maybe, maybe somehow this particular mutation restores the activity of this gene. And if that gene is expressed, it should be detrimental to tumor growth. So first, when we look at the activity of this gene in our non-regressed tumors, that is what we see. We see essentially no activity of this gene in non-regressed tumors. It's been shut off, as we would expect. And that allows the tumor to grow uncontrollably. But when we look at our regressed tumors, we see that, yes, this gene has been activated. This gene is now expressed. 
in regressed tumors, suggesting that maybe the expression of this gene is contributing to tumor regression. So we were really excited about this. We have a single mutation activating a tumor suppressor, and it makes sense that it could potentially lead to tumor regression. Um, it's exciting, it's suggestive, but right now it's a just-so story. Right? This is by no means definitive. So how can we actually test whether this particular gene, this singular gene, affects tumor growth rates? Well, we have several DFTD tumor cell lines in the lab. So what we can do is we can take those cells and we can manipulate them. We can, can make some cells that express this RASA11A gene, and we can make some cells that don't, and then we can see, does one grow better than the other? Right? Does the activation of this gene affect tumor growth rates in the lab? So that's what we did, and that's what I'm showing here on the left. So here on the left, we have RASA11A expression increasing on the y-axis. We can see in our control lines, these represent our non-regressed tumors, this gene's inactive. It's not expressed, just like it is in the non-regressed tumors. When we look at our RAS lines, we can see this gene is expressed. So we made these cell lines, and then we just essentially grew them. And again, we want to know, does one grow better than the other? So that's what we are looking at here on the right, is our growth rate estimates. So we have time on the x-axis, growth rate on the y, and here we are looking at growth rates for our control lines. These are the lines that do not express this gene, sort of our baseline estimates. These represent the non-regressed tumor growth rates. So what happens when we flip the switch and turn that gene on? What happens to growth rates? They can either increase, they can decrease, or they can stay the same. Right? And if RASA11A is contributing to tumor regression, we would expect growth rates to decrease. And that's exactly what we found. We found that RAS expression significantly reduced tumor growth rates in both tumor lines, demonstrating that, yes, the activation of this gene is bad for tumor growth. RAS expression inhibits tumor growth rates and is most likely playing a pretty large role in this natural tumor regression that we are seeing in Tasmanian devils. So again, really excited about this. We sort of have this proof of concept, this single mutation activates this gene, reduces tumor growth rates. The next obvious question is how? Right, so I'm really interested in mechanisms. This really isn't the mechanism. What does RAS do that would lead it to actually affect tumor growth rates? Why is it bad for tumor growth? Um, well, RAS is a known regulator of RDNA transcription. And just a little bit of cell biology background, RDNA transcription, this is the rate-limiting step in ribosome biogenesis. Um, and very simply put, if we can't make ribosomes, we cannot make protein. If we cannot make protein, we cannot have cell growth. Um, and tumor suppressors in human cancers have been known to inhibit our DNA transcription. So we thought maybe RASA11A was doing something similar here. So to test that, we took these same cell lines and we measured our DNA transcription. So here again, we are looking at our control lines. These are the lines that do not express this gene. Again, represent sort of our non-regressed tumor case and our baseline estimates of our DNA transcription. So what happens when we flip the switch and turn this RAS gene back on? Well, if RAS is doing what we think it's doing, if it's doing similar things to what it potentially does in human cancers, we would expect to see the same pattern we saw on the left in our growth rate assays. We would expect to see a significant reduction in our DNA transcription in the lines that do express this gene. And again, that is exactly what we found. Right? So this suggests that RAS L11A expression is somehow inhibiting the formation of ribosomes. And these cells just simply can't make enough protein to grow effectively. And that is actually the specific tumor suppressive function of this gene in DFTD. Um, okay, so I spent a lot of time sort of talking about here, right? So I said a lot of my interests sort of lied in how are the devils actually responding? Um, but how are they going to respond going forward, right? If we look at this system right now, we see evidence that the devils are adapting to the disease. They are increasing in numbers. We are getting tumor regression. Females are more tolerant of the disease. We're seeing lots of positive things. Um, but 50 years from now, 100 years from now, what is this system going to look like? What is the Tasmanian devil going to do? Remember, all of our uh, disease models predicted extinction within 25 to 30 years. So we know that that's not going to happen, because that was in 1996 but we still don't know what's going to happen going forward. And again, there are really three outcomes. Um, the Tasmanian devil can go extinct, the disease can go extinct, or the two can coexist together. Um, so some collaborators of mine recently developed a new modeling approach to predict just that. So they use this new modeling approach incorporating a lot of the information that I presented here to sort of predict these long-term outcomes of this particular disease. And what they found was that Tasmanian devil extinction was actually the least likely outcome. 
So what we are looking at here on the bottom are these percentages of these possible outcomes. They found that Tasmanian devils only went extinct in about 21% of their simulations, whereas the disease went extinct in about 57% of those simulations. So disease extinction was by far the most common outcome, with coexistence being roughly equivalent um, to devil extinction. So we are looking at DFTD extinction here in scenario one. So on top, we have the devil population size. On the bottom, we have the disease prevalence. And we can see you know, in our model, the population crashes, which is just like we saw in the real world. We have this population recovery, which is where we're at now. But we can see that here, the disease potentially can go extinct. Devil population recovers. And over the next 100 years, seems to be doing OK. Here on the right in scenario two, we are looking at coexistence. So here we're going to have these cyclical changes or these oscillations where devil population density and DFTD prevalence are going to cycle in tandem. So devils will crash, they will recover, crash and recover, crash and recover. And this is partly due to how the disease is transmitted. Uh, so the disease is partly frequency dependent and partly density dependent. So this means that disease transmission is partly dependent on how many devils are in the population. So we can imagine that as populations crash, disease transmission becomes less likely, the disease prevalence will reduce. Um, but overall, I think that this sort of modeling, our, our predictions now based on what we are seeing in the short term and our models of what they are showing in the long term present a much more optimistic picture than what we thought was going to happen when we first discovered this disease. Right? We all thought this was going to be the extinction of the devil, but we haven't seen any extinction events. And sort of more sophisticated modeling approaches suggest that devil extinction is very unlikely, again, at least over the next 50 to 100 years. And one of the things that we can do with this system is we can sort of ground truth our model. Right? We can test it. We're going to see what happens over the next 50 years in this system to see whether these particular models and whether our simulations are accurate. OK, so I just wanted to end my seminar by sort of discussing what I'm specifically doing here at Harvard as part of my fellowship. Um, so sort of an emerging theme in cancer biology is something called tumor heterogeneity. Uh, so this is where a single tumor is actually comprised of multiple independent tumor cell populations. And that's what we are looking at in the figure here. We can see we have our normal or our healthy cells in gray, our founder cancer cell in red. But then as mutations accumulate, we can see a purple population arise and then a blue population arise. So by the time we get to the end, this singular tumor is actually composed of three independent tumor cell populations. And these populations can actually compete with one another through a process called clonal interference. Uh, this is one of the big reasons why a single drug does not work well on a single cancer or a single tumor in humans, because a single tumor is not a single entity. right? It is multiple entities. Um, but how this sort of heterog heterogeneity affects things like cancer growth or disease progression is really unclear. And no one to date has looked at tumor heterogeneity in transmissible cancers. So this is what I am going to be doing here. Now, I've, I mentioned very early on in the talk in the table that there were two transmissible cancers in Tasmanian devils. So I have focused on DFT1 throughout my talk, what I have been calling DFTD. Uh, but a second independently derived transmissible cancer called DFT2 was just recently discovered in the south central portion of the island, shown here in the map. And if we look at our photos on the bottom, the symptomology is very similar. So this is also a facial cancer. It is an infectious cancer. It has a very high mortality rate. Um, the reason we know that it's independently derived is that DFT2 has pieces of the Y chromosome in its genome. So remember, DFT1 originated in the northeastern corner, only had pieces of the X chromosome, which is why we think it originated in a female devil. DFT2 has pieces of the Y chromosome, suggesting that it originated in a male devil in the south central part of Tasmania. I mentioned it's very similar to DFT1, but it's currently restricted to this very small peninsula shown here. So this, is, this disease right now is geographically restricted. It doesn't appear to be able to spread north. Um, we're not sure whether that is due to low devil populations in those areas or whether potentially competition dynamics with DFT1. Maybe it just doesn't transmit as well as DFT1. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm taking both DFT1 and DFT2 tumors and using single cell transcriptomics to sort of assess tumor heterogeneity. So I'm going to characterize individual cells within each tumor, determine how many different cell types are in these tumors, and then link that back to things like tumor regression or tumor growth rates or survival following infection, and really determine how tumor heterogeneity affects cancer evolution and disease progression. 
And I just wanted to end the talk by really focusing on the power of comparative oncology. Uh, so comparative oncology, this is studying cancers in non-human systems and animal systems, and then using that information to develop treatments that help both animals and humans. Um, now, a lot of this work was historically done in mice and now in dogs. Uh, so dogs are actually a great model for comparative oncology. They have very similar cancers, very similar response time. Um, but we can learn a lot from studying cancers in animals other than dogs, right? Things like Tasmanian devils. And this is largely because of ethical considerations, right? So here we found in Tasmanian devils evidence of natural unmedicated tumor regression, right? These devils got cancer and they got better. That is something that we would not be able to study in humans, for example, or potentially not even be able to study in dogs. Um, but studying cancer in these natural populations allows us to really learn more about natural cancer progression and potentially things like natural tumor regression. And if we can better understand the mechanisms contributing to things like tumor regression, we can potentially develop drugs that do very similar things, right, and lead to better sort of therapeutics for human cancers. And with that, I would just like to thank my collaborators here at Harvard as well as across the US and Australia. None of this work was done in isolation. Uh, I'd very much like to thank Sarah and Daniel Hurdy, who sponsor my fellowship and are the reason I am here. Uh, the museum for hosting this talk, everyone in the department in OEB. Um, everyone's been great. I've really enjoyed my six months here. And with that, I'd like to end the talk with a snake photo. I do work on another system, which I think is just as equally cool, uh, snake venom evolution. And with that, I will gladly take any questions. <laughs>